Okay, Joseph Schooling, welcome to the podcast, mate. How are you? Good, Brett. Thanks for having me, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm good. Where are you right now? I'm in Christiansburg, Virginia, training at VT with Surge. So back with the Surge Meister. Uh, <laughs> it's freezing outside, definitely from the tropics. This is an anomaly for me. Nothing, nothing that I'd like to get used to, but it's a good place to be right now. It's a good place. It's it's my, it's why I wore the Rocky shirt, man. You're bunkered down and you know in the, in the <laughs> snow doing the Rocky stuff. <laughs> Creed, Creed too, huh? Yeah. See when he's out in the desert. <laughs> exactly. That's you right now. But listen, man, you don't do many interviews, so thanks for doing this. What's your what's your theory on interviews? Why don't why don't we know much about you? Why don't you put stuff out there? Yeah, I'm more of a private person. Um, I do do interviews, but you know I like to focus on being present, just staying in the moment. Um, focusing on the big stuff but if a cool interview if a cool request comes out like i'd love to be on your show then of course we'll make it happen so this is pretty cool thanks for having me on here no i appreciate it man listen yeah. um uh, yeah, look i know from your family history and who you are and how you were raised you've got incredible parents uh, your, your dad colin and, and your mom may uh, you're an only child um mm -hmm. you know just beautiful parents and, and they did an exceptional job with you just tell us about how they raised you in terms of um your relationship with them and kind of the sacrifices they made for you yeah so i mean you know um i think as any singaporean kid would tell you the norm for the parents or i'd say asian parents at least would be you'd have the overbearing mother and the super strict father i suppose but those things don't really do justice in describing my parents you know i'd say they were a lot more open-minded than their peers for that generation keep in mind and that allowed me to mature at a, at a younger age make decisions for myself live with the consequences reap the benefits so that kind of process kind of helped me mature a lot faster and of course moving to bowls at 13 um introduced a whole different world staying in a dorm um, I know this might sound petty, but uh, if anyone lived in Singapore or around that region, they'd understand what I'm saying in terms of having to do my own laundry, having to wake up on time by myself to catch the school bus. You know, in Singapore, we're very privileged. We're very lucky to have support staff and a bunch of great people around us to help us attain certain goals. But in the U.S., you're kind of thrust into this, this environment where it's a huge DIY. You know, you got to do it yourself. You got to get up on time. You got to manage things by yourself. You got to be accountable. So that part was kind of the second stage of me maturing. And I couldn't have gotten to this point without mom and dad, definitely. Their unconditional love, their support. Um, sounds very cliche, but if you're in my situation, and I'm sure a lot of people are around the world, you'd be able to understand what it means to have a solid family backing with solid family values. So that's how I describe mom and dad. Great people, great parents, solid people overall. Yeah, and I agree with that, just knowing them myself. But it's interesting you were, you use the word privilege. Uh, you know, in the context of that word itself, you wouldn't necessarily say that a, a, a spoiled, privileged kid, uh, an only child, would have the foresight like you had to kind of Put yourself in a situation uncomfortable situation like balls to, to move away from your your family and 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 at a at very young age were you uh very clear in who you wanted to be at a young age in terms of your goals and where you wanted to go yeah before i answer that i think privilege and spoiled are usually used in the same sentence right but there is a really important reason why i didn't use spoiled because my parents didn't grow up privileged my parents had to work for everything that they had they have every single set. So they knew the right way to bring up a child was, okay, you try to provide them the best resources possible. But at the end of the day, it's all about instilling those good values and just trying to help your child achieve their dreams without being too overly pushy. You know, if they, if someone wants it, they're going to go push themselves with the right support around them, of course. Um, going back to your question, uh, Sorry, I'm drawing a blank again, Brett. What was your What was your question around that? Oh no, I mean, it just uh, you mean we can move away from that in terms of the the photograph the, of of you and Michael mm -hmm. Phelps. What age was that where this very famous photo of you and Michael took place? Yeah, so that took place in 08. Um, it was around June. 
they're having their staging camp at the SICC, Singapore Island Country Club, which was the club that I was swimming at at that point of time. Dad was the convener, so he was able to arrange everything for the U.S. team. And it was just cool um, being able to see, you know, Crocker, um, Michael over there, just like a bunch of the greats. Eddie Reese was there too. He was the head coach at 08. Wow. So it's, it's crazy how everything comes full circle. But yeah, I mean, it's just phenomenal experience um, being able to see the U.S. Olympic team. I think to the outside world, the U.S. Olympic team is, it's the mecca of swimming, right? It's the mecca. It's everyone wants to be on the U.S. Olympic team. So being able to see that, from the eyes of a 12 year old, uh, that was something spectacular. Did it have like, did it have the impact that we think when we look at it, we're like, wow, that must've been a huge event for him. Was it really that big a deal for you at the time? Yeah. I mean, Michael's always been my hero, you know, especially that time growing up. Um, I've always idolized and looked up to him. And of course, when you meet your childhood heroes, you kind of start blushing and you kind of start freaking out internally, you know, you lose your cool. But yeah, it was a big deal for me um, to meet Michael at that age, especially since how everyone wanted a picture with Michael. I think when you're young, you see your friends want something, you kind of jump on that, that bandwagon and you want the same things too, you know, you're, you're being kids. So I think that expedited that process as well, that escalated it. Yeah, very cool. Now, I talked to Sergio a little earlier, who's your your current coach, also your your coach back at, at Bowles when you when you moved mm -hmm. there at thirteen, and he was telling he kind of likened you to almost a, a Messi or a Ronaldo. You know, when you think of the ball at their feet, uh, just the the ease he he called it dancing with the ball uh, when he described those two. But when he talked about you, he was talking about the same sort of dance that you play in the water. He says you have this. Uh, incredible feel for the water um, mm -hmm. unlike uh, it's almost like a gift that you have been given from birth this feel for the water is that something you you've recognized from an early age yeah I mean of course recognizing it from an early age I don't think I have you know all I knew from an early age was just how to swim fast but at that point all you know is one thing or two things really how fast you're going and whether you, you're winning or not that's all you're focusing on but the older I got right now in this position, being able to discover new things, it's all about how quick you pick something up, right? Someone can pick it up in a week versus someone can pick it up in a month or a day or a second. You just get that much more time to build on the foundation that you've set yourself upon to get to the next level. So when I think about picking up skills or water feel, I just think about how fast that person can adapt to a new environment, how fast that person can adapt to his stroke and adapt to the new stroke or the changes that they want to make. And eventually we're all going to start moving forward. We all need to start getting better and better. I think a really good analogy, a golf analogy, let's move away a bit from swimming. I, I saw an interview with Rory McIlroy and you know, when he was tearing it up uh, in the early 2010s, he was saying that he needed to change his swing um, and the feel didn't feel right, but he just needed to make those uncomfortable adjustments to get his swing to the next level. Mm. Now coming back to swimming, of course, I've always been a feel swimmer, like huge feel swimmer. And sometimes I don't even like watching, watching tape. I don't like watching film. But you need to understand to get to a new level, you have to do things that you haven't done before. And that's where Serge plays a huge part. He balances the mental game with whatever he sees in the pool and whatever you're doing in the pool so well. And he can put those things together and you can move forward at a very rapid pace. Tell me about your training group at Bowls. You get there at a young age. Uh, was you know you had this incredible group of athletes around the same time. I know Ryan Murphy was there, and Caleb Dressel was you know um, part of the, the nighttime. Team. Yeah, the club team as yeah. well. Uh, you had Santa Condarelli. You had this incredible group. It was just this freak of nature that you had these these uh, yeah. young kids who go on to be champions. Uh, three of them become Olympic champions. Santo in his own right is, is a champion swimmer himself, but um, it is pretty freaky that you're all there at the same time, right? Yeah, that, that stuff doesn't happen often. And I still remember while we're in the moment in high school together, me, Ryan, Santo, and we've heard Sergio say a few times, you know, you know, this doesn't happen. This is not normal. This will probably never happen again in our lifetime. Things like that. And we're just looking at each other like, what? Like, what are you talking about? This is normal. Like, I'm Joe, there's Ryan, there's Caleb, there's Santo. Like, 
Mm -hmm. cool we come together form a relay kill everyone at juniors and that's that's the norm for us you know we don't know anything else besides to do what we're doing but now that we're 10 years removed from that taking a step back in hindsight that was actually pretty special you know i don't think there's any other program out there right now that has all these swimmers under one group one coach of course you got jason who did a great job with the club team but everyone to just be under the same roof that's that's out of this world and it doesn't happen yeah it's freaky that it was a, a a club team and it was a high school club team you know you maybe in a college team you, you certainly had that at texas but but not in that environment it's just really crazy now you're obviously to get to where you ended up being you're all very competitive and very um mm -hmm. driven so how did that dynamic play out was that was that challenging for you to have a teammate like ryan murphy or you know caleb dressel or how, how was that for you so i'm gonna use ryan as an example because i've trained with ryan more and i think having having a friend or ha and having a training partner like ryan at first was tough you know it's it's like i was a new kid on the block and uh you know me you've known me for long enough brett you know what kind of attitude I have towards practice or racing, what I bring to the table. And when you have someone with a similar fire and, you know, similar temperaments as you, you can clash. Of course, you will definitely clash at first. So I'd say, you know, for the first year, year and a half, um, Ryan and I were feeling each other out. And the more we got to know each other, the more we spent time together, um, the better things got. And it kept getting better and better. And all of a sudden, it went from, you know, I want to beat this guy. Like, I don't care if he does well. I just want to do well for myself into, I want him to do well too. I want him to succeed. And we want each other to succeed. So you can see the dynamic really changed after one or two years. And from then on, you know, I consider Ryan one of my closest friends to this day. And it's just been a privilege having to know him. Awesome, man. I love that. Um why did you end up choosing Texas in the end? Uh, you had you had the choice to to go to any college in the country, and I mean, for me, it makes perfect sense. But like, I just wanted your opinion. Why was Texas mm -hmm. the home for you? Good question. So, when I narrowed my schools down to five schools, um, my three criteria for each school would be broken up into academics, mm -hmm. um, swim team, and also how the city, you know, the atmosphere. How's it going to be like? Now, I took trips to four schools, Michigan, Florida, Texas, and Cal. Mm -hmm. You know, it came down to really Texas and Florida. Cal was, was below Florida. And the only reason why I chose Texas was because of the academics. And if you look across the board, at that point of time, and still now, all solid swim programs, academically, all solid academically, the only thing that stood out for Texas, especially Austin, was the way of life. You know, I think many people don't take into account, they see school, okay, the school is great. They see swim program, the swim program is great, but they forget that they need to live in that place for four, four to five years, depending on how fast you finish school. And the atmosphere that you live in, it can be swim, can be school all the time. You need to go out and have fun. You know, you need to let loose a little bit. And I feel like Austin, combined with the team, and of course with Eddie, whatever he had put together at Texas at that point of time, everything kind of lined up together. So Texas was the best fit for me. What about Eddie? Why was Eddie good for you in terms of developing you into this Olympic champion or continuing the mm -hmm. development? Yep. Okay. So the first question I asked all the college coaches was, how do you, how do you see international swimmers in terms of will you be able to come with me on international meets to worlds or will you have other obligations to let's say the US or a different country? And of course for me, like I don't like sharing, like I want my own coach there, you know? And when I asked Eddie that, he looked me straight in the eye and I know what he Eddie Reese means to the US and I know what Eddie Reese means to USA swimming. And for him to say, yes, I'll come to the Olympics with you, you know, that I believed him and he did, you know? Um, I knew he was gonna be true to his word. And I knew everything else would, would take its place. That was the only question I needed to know. So in terms of the training itself, um, let's fast forward because I know we're on a, a tight schedule here. But in terms of the, the 16 where you go on to win the Olympic gold medal, in the lead up to 16, 
what, how were things clicking for you? What were you doing and what was working for you at that time? Mm -hmm. So when I think of 16, I, I think of two things. One, Christmas training at Nitro Swim Club. Um, usually we get 10 days off, a week to 10 days. And I didn't want to stop swimming. And, you know, mom and dad came into town. I continued swimming in Austin. I think we got a lot of good long course training in, a lot of good conditioning. Um, if anyone knows the Nitro program, the first thing they think about, it's like NCAP, right? You know, they crush the yards, they work hard, they're grinders. So I think that set kind of the base leading up into the following summer. And the second thing is non-swim related. The second thing is I got probably the sickest I've ever gotten. I felt ill, um, caught a virus, had a 102 fever. Um, I was bedridden for two weeks. And I remember swimming at the January Pro Swim Series meet in Austin. And I went 54-6 or 54-3 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely had nothing behind me. And I was thinking, well, this is it, right? Like, <laughs> it, it, it's over. Like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to move at the Olympics. So I was kind of disheartened over there. But moving forward, I got better and better rapidly. And I really think looking back, um, I took two weeks off weights. And all I did was just focus on swimming. And I think that was kind of the key moment of letting my body recover, but at the same time, get the conditioning I need in the pool, which we were doing a bunch of 200s long course freestyle best average on repeat. And I really think looking back, that was one of the key defining moments I could have done. Mm, nice. I like that a lot. Now, jumping forward to the Olympics, um, you know, I've watched a lot of Michael Phelps's races and he has been beaten at times, but he's never been dominated. Uh, unlike the way I felt like you dominated him in that race. I mean, you didn't beat Michael Phelps. You, you, you beat the whole field, including Michael Phelps. But I mean, you won that race by half a body length. It was a complete and utter domination from start to finish. And I, I was talking to Sergio again. He said that he was lucky that you invited him to be part of the Olympic team with Eddie. So uh, you, you also asked him to walk to the ready room with you and Eddie at that point in time. So you had two coaches walk into the ready room with you. And, and I know that was a very special moment for Sergio, but he said that, you know, he was very nervous, obviously. And you looked at him and you said, don't worry, I got this. So mm -hmm. in terms of like having that type of confidence against this childhood hero and then going out and, and, abs and I'm not, I'm, this is not a slide on Michael, but dominating the race about winning in the fashion that you won. How were you mm -hmm. able to do that? Yeah, I think before that, we need to go back two months to June. Um, it was another meet in Austin. Michael came to that meet. And I, to this day, I still remember how dead tired I was. You know, it was one of those where, Brett, you almost felt sick in the warm up, And, you know, your body was cold or shivering. It was almost like you're going to fall ill. Um, but in th this instance, I was just beat up from practice. And I knew Jack was next to me. Michael was on the other side. And I touched the wall. And before I looked at the time, because Michael was coming, I still remember, I said, if, if I'm able to win now in this shape, when I rest, no one's going to touch me. Like, it's just not going to happen. So to answer your question, moving forward to Rio, um, taking you through prelims, semis. Prelims, I was next to Michael. It was an easy race um, just to qualify top 16. Semis, uh, put a little more juice in, but I still knew I had more left in the tank. I still knew I had, I had some left. So going to finals, I'm first, first. Now all I need to do is just go a bit faster and, you know, you probably win. I knew that I had way more in the tank than anyone in the field, given the event lineup and also the position, my body, my mind, everything was just clicking at that meet. So the hardest part about that race, weirdly enough, was the bus ride over. You know, it's kind of like, it, this isn't a movie, this is real life, but it was one of those where you stare out it was late at night, I think like nine o'clock, finals were at 11. And you kind of just see 10 years flash before you in that 20 minute bus ride. Mm. Your heart rate's pumping, you're starting to get sweaty, you're starting to get nervous. And you're thinking like, all right, I, know I just need to control my emotions. I need to control my nerves right now. And if I can do that, this is where I win the race, right here in this bus. And I knew once I could do that, calm myself down, step out of the bus, everything else was blank. Went through the motions, got ready, and the rest is history. 
Wow. That's incredible. And, and I appreciate you sharing that story there because there are moments I believe where you do have to take control of your emotions. And it's nice that you recognize mm -hmm. that on the bus. Um, you know, it's one thing to think that you can beat Michael. It's one thing to know that you're conditioned to beat Michael, but it's certainly another thing to actually go and do it. Uh, was there any doubt behind the blocks or, you know, where is your focus when you're actually standing behind the blocks in that Olympic final, where is your focus at that point in time? Right on the other touch pad down the pool in my lane. I don't look anywhere else. Um, sometimes in the stands, I try to look for mom and dad. Um, usually I try to ask them where they're sitting so that I can just look at them once. And then the rest, I'm just, you know, it's business, it's game time. So on a normal day, um, without looking in the stands, I just look straight at my block, just focus on breathing, look straight down the lane. Just, you know, that lane is yours. It's yours to own, it's yours to defend, it's yours to protect, it's yours to dominate. And everything else doesn't matter, man. You know, it's you and your lane. So that's all I think about. And that's all really anyone should focus on. Not how I look, not, you know, my black cap looks cool at night <laughs> or no, none, none of that. You're here to win, you're here to dominate, you're here to do your job. And after you win, everything looks good on you, right? <laughs> Why do you think you, have you asked yourself that question? Why was I able to do this and other people weren't? No, I don't think so. I just think one, obviously um, I'm lucky to have um, genetically gifted to be able to swim at you know a certain speed. But I think the other attributes that people don't really take into account, one of the most important things before this person can be the most gifted genetically, but if he doesn't have the right atmosphere or the right support to get him to realize his potential, it means nothing. I'm quite sure there are thousands of people in the world that are more genetically gifted than I am, but unfortunately they don't have the same support resources or, you know, maybe luck in finding great coaches like Serge and Eddie um, to help them realize their potential. So a lot of it is if you're star if the stars align, it's meant to be, it's meant to be. But once you see, once you have that opportunity, it's onto you and no one else to just realize that by yourself. You're going to practice, you're eating right, you're sleeping right, you're recovering, you're focused, you're trying to find ways to get better. Opportunity is there, but it's all up to you to use that opportunity to get what you want. I like that, man. I like that a lot. It's really good advice. Um, there, there's certainly something within you that I have. Uh, it's very rare. i uh, put it this way. I mean, I've seen you practice. I've seen you compete. I know you intimately through your, your coaches as well. And, and I know there's something special there in terms of maybe, I, I don't know how to put it exactly, but it might just be a grit or a determination or a, I mean, you really do want to win, don't you? I mean, you hate you hate to lose too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I hate to lose more than I like to win. You know, I think at one point, once you start winning and winning, it's kind of like, okay, cool, what's next, you know? But it's when you start losing that you're just like, you grit your teeth and you just can't stand it. I can't stand losing. <laughs> you know, I, I really can't. You can ask anyone around my roommate, like Jack. Jack Honger just came to train with us. So that brings back a lot of memories for Texas and how we go at it in practice. Like we hate to lose to each other. We hate it. But I was actually going to say that, you know, your, your yeah. relationship with Jack Conga, there was, there was definitely some conflict there at, at your time at yeah. Texas, right? Yeah, it was crazy. You know, we we're just at IHOP um, this morning after practice, eating with my, with my roommate and a couple of friends. And Jack just goes like losing to Joe is the worst thing ever. You know, like I hate losing to Joe. I hate losing, but I hate losing to Joe even more. I looked at Jack. I'm like, yeah, I hate losing you too. So, <laughs> so we we have we have a good rivalry, but at the same time, we know what's most important to us is our friendship. And swimming swimming is temporary, but the bond that we have is forever. That's the most important thing. I love that, man. Now, tell me this, just in, in kind of closing, why are you doing this? I mean, you've got fame, you've you've got fortune, you've got the Olympic gold. Why continue to do this? Why take another shot at this in 21? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, Eddie, one of the most important things Eddie has said to me to this day is, Joseph, you can't do it for the money. And I used to think like, you know, as a college swimmer going into your professional career, of course, who doesn't want to make the most money possible? But I'm like, Eddie, if you're getting paid a, uh, paid a lot of money, like I find it hard to imagine 
that you can't find any motivation or any fire to keep doing this for the money. He just looked at me and smiled. But year, fast forward years down, I can, I can fully tell you that there's no amount of money and there's no amount of external pressure or external motivation that can fuel you to be your best. Why am I doing it, Brett? I'm doing it because I don't think I'm done with swimming. I'm not done with swimming. And I know that I have more to give. And I think just the pursuit of getting better, the pursuit of going through the ups and downs to one day, hopefully at the end of the tunnel, going a best time, you know, winning. I think that, it, that in itself, it's beautiful. You know, it's wonderful. Um, just find, finding that, that intrinsic personal perfection. Awesome. That's what keeps me going. I love it. Well, Thanks, listen, man. man, you're going to have a big task ahead of you with one of your former teammates. Uh, do you think you, can, you think you can slay this dragon? You've slayed, you slayed one big dragon. What about Caleb Dressel? You think you could take him down? Caleb's a pretty big, big dragon, man. We'll see. You know, he's not right now, but over that, I'm just focusing on myself. You know, whatever happens, happens at the end of the day. As long as I give it 100%, I know. I, I love watching you <laughs> swim fast, so keep it up, all right? I'm a big Thank fan. You. I will. Thanks, Brett. Thanks for having me and I hope to see you soon. Take care, buddy. Bye. You too.